Council, but also on behalf of my supervisor, Molly Sperduto, who isn't here because she's on vacation, as well as um, colleagues and friends that also worked on this project, Drew Major, some of you may know Drew, and Veronica Varela, and they both worked on uh, this project during the response and assessment phases. Let me figure this out. Perfect. So first I'm gonna talk about piping plover. Um, they are a small North American shorebird that utilize sandy and mixed sand and gravel beaches and sandy tidal flats. So we've talked about um, some of the habitats that were oiled. These are some of those habitats. Uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island support breeding habitat of more than one third of the Atlantic coast population and nearly 15% of the total pairs worldwide. So it's a very significant area for these birds. They are listed as threatened federally in addition to Massachusetts and Rhode Island endangered species lists. At the time of the spill, the birds were beginning to arrive to their nesting sites. And those nesting sites included um, more than 50 pairs, were, were accommodating more than 50 pairs the year of the spill, that the year that the, sp the spill occurred. Um, they were at risk from direct oiling and cleanup efforts. Um, which is kind of a weird thing to think about. Our cleanup efforts, you know, sometimes put these resources at risk. And we have to take that into account whenever we are trying to um, uh, compensate for the loss of these birds, which, you'll, which I'll talk a little bit more about as we go. So the trustees worked with cooperating bird and conservation organiza organizations to monitor several times per week for four months. And to kind of put that into context, they generated over 3,800 individual data sheets associated with all of this, all this effort. So based on this, uh, the trustees were able to estimate that approximately five fledglings and 12 adult plovers were lost in addition to the indirect loss of potential fledges that would have occurred over the lifespan of the birds that were killed. And why is it estimated? Well, because sometimes when we go out there, we don't catch everything. These are fairly small birds. So sometimes they are scavenged. Sometimes they're so degraded we miss them. Sometimes they're washed away. So we put in modeling principles um, to account for kind of this mismatch of what we're able to find and what we don't find. And so that's why these numbers are estimated. And you'll also often see, you know, 12.5 birds or, or something along those lines. But it's, it's because of that, it's because of math. So someone else is better at that than I am. So uh, the trustees sat down with the responsible parties and successfully negotiated the settlement of $715,000 to compensate for the loss of the plovers. And they issued a final restoration plan in 2013, is that right? <laughs> Piping plovers were actually lumped into a restoration plan associated with shoreline, well, no, not, they were part of the negotiation of the shoreline and aquatic restoration. Um, and that was because we wanted to go ahead and expedite some of this, um, uh, some of the restoration for the wildlife that was injured. So the other birds I'll talk about were lumped into a, a later settlement. So that restoration plan um, selected an alternative that involved an enhanced management program for piping plovers and that was a three-tiered approach of predator management, law enforcement, and public outreach and educa education. So this is where I have, to, I have to read this. And I, I apologize, I'm not from the Northeast originally, so if I butcher some of these names, feel free to just like shout them back out to me. You're not from around here, are you? No, I'm not, I'm sorry. Um, so they awarded funds to seven organizations to implement restoration across Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, Biodiversity Works, they undertook four projects in Martha's Vineyard um, at Dogfish Bar, along Edgartown Great Pond, and at Cedar Tree Neck and Tashmoo and West Tashmoo. Massachusetts Audubon implemented projects at Little Beach within Allen's Pond Wildlife Sanctuary and Dead Neck and Samson Islands. Did I get those? Yeah, I did. Um, the Nature Conservancy undertook projects at Briggs and Goosewing Beaches in Little Compton, Rhode Island. The Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation uh, were performing activities in Demarest Lloyd State Park, Horse Neck Beach State Reservation, South Cape Beach, and Sandy Point. 
And then let's see, the trustees of reservation perform work at Leland Beach on Chappaquiddick. You got it? Yeah. <laughs> Um, Norton Point Beach and Martha's Vineyard, Coscata Co2. You got anybody heard of that? Coscata Co2 Wildlife Refuge on Nantucket and Crane Beach in Ipswich. There were several. There were several sites within within and in proximity to National Wildlife Refuge System, to the National Wildlife Refuge System. Um, so, including Parker River Refuge, Na Sandy Point State Reservation, Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge in Massachusetts, Quinnacatog. Maybe <laughs> Quinnacatuck and and Nindigret and Trustum National Wildlife Refuges in Rhode Island. Finally, the town of Plymouth also implemented um, a project uh, along Long Beach in Rhode Island. So this map ultimately represents all the work that was able to be done. Um, I mean, it's it's the the reason for it is unfortunate. However, what we were able to do with that and turn it around and implement all this restoration, it really shows the strength of our partnerships and the importance of those partnerships. We were able to implement, it was actually over 20 restoration activities spread, spread across two states, all working together to achieve the same goal, and that was to restore the loss of those plovers. So moving on to common loons. We've talked about common loons a lot. They're fairly charismatic species. So this was part of a $13.3 million settlement. Um, there's also a poster outside that is an eyesore. I'm sorry, I didn't bring an easel that was tall enough, but you're welcome to go and read more about these projects as well as see pictures from our collaborators. It's, they've put in a lot of work and I'm happy to represent them. So I'm sure we're all familiar with loons, but just to, to brief everybody, they're a large diving water bird that breed on freshwater lakes throughout the northern US. In the winter, they range along ocean coasts fairly close to the shore and in bays and estuaries. And that is where they were during the time of the buzzard's bay spill. So they were still technically on their wintering grounds. The trustees estimated that the number of common loon killed by the spill, either through acute or delayed effects, to be 531 birds. In addition, the trustees estimated the loss of the first generation that would have fledged had those birds not been killed. So with this, we also accounted for other birds that were injured. <laughs> It'll be a little bit more than a minute, I'm sorry. <laughs> so other birds that were injured, um, such as the common eider, the, the black scoter, the red-throated loon. They were also impacted by the spill, and the trustee es trustees estimated that loss as well as the loss of their first generation. Altogether, $7.3 in funds were awarded um, toward loon restoration in New England and New York. Why, why New York? Why not just in Massachusetts or Rhode Island? So we kind of refer to this as um, full, life, full life cycle restoration. So these birds, they're wintering in Buzzards Bay, yes, but they fly elsewhere to breed. And where can, be, where can we have the most impact on, on them and, and to put back what was lost? And we feel like in this case, because we even found um, lightly oiled birds that flew to New York and flew to New Hampshire. We were able to fingerprint that bird in New Hampshire. Um, th fingerprint the, the oil that we found on the bird in New Hampshire. So they're flying elsewhere. So that's why we move this money elsewhere because these birds don't abide by our political boundaries. They, they, you know, they find other habitats equally as important. Um, we also allocated a million, or were awarded a million toward other bird restoration in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. So a suite of projects was selected to restore common loon. The first one listed being the translocation and captive rearing project that you've heard about, which is really exciting. That's to restore common loons across their historic breeding range in Massachusetts. Um, let's see, and then a comprehensive suite of of projects including artificial nest rafts, signs and boarding, rescue and rehabilitation, lead tackle exchange and buyback programs, which is really excited. So really exciting. Um, and then the breeding habitat protection and site management is was essentially um, to compensate for the loss of other birds, to have the biggest impact for the most species. 
So I, I just want to say about this map is you're, I'm gonna there's gonna be little placeholders in this map as well representing locations of where restoration is happening, but it, they're much bigger than that. These these um, project partners that we're working with are covering a lot of ground, so it's not just um, centralizing the location of the the placeholder. It's hundreds and hundreds of miles all across the states. So trustees awarded seven organizations fun funding to implement restoration across. New England and New York, um, and these, again, these projects cover a lot of miles across the entire region. Maine Audubon, um, they have sites all across southern Maine. Biodiversity Research Institute has sites in northern Maine's down east region, Square Lakes Complex, and all across Massachusetts, as well as that translocation and captive rearing project um, that Gerard mentioned, um, they have sites at the Asawamsa Pond Complex and at the Berkshires. Um, the trustees were also able to provide money to the Forest Society of Maine to assist in a land purchase in Coburn Gore that conserved over 8,000 acres of land in, that includes two Loon Lakes, which will be managed by their partners with BRI. So they're all working together with that one. The Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation is implemented um, a comprehensive management plan as well, um, and it takes place in Adirondack Park. But it, you know, if you think park, it's it's much, much. It does the calling it a park kind of doesn't do it justice because it's over six million acres, um, a mosaic of private and public lands and waters in northeast uh, northeast New York State, um, with you know an amazing loon population and amazing group of people working there. So Vermont Center Eco Studies works statewide in Vermont. Um, and then the Loon Preservation Committee um, are the folks who implement loon, rest loon restoration in New Hampshire. And finally, a land protection project is in the works, which will benefit the numerous other bird species in coastal Rhode Island. Did I get that one? Maybe it didn't pop down. Oh, there it is. Yes. So again, this map represents a significant amount of effort put into these projects and what you don't see are the hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, the lake associations, Native American tribes, rescue organizations, local, state, and federal collaborators, all there who are wanting to restore common loons. And it's not just because they heard about an oil spill one day and they wanted, they, but it's because they genuinely love these birds. So I'm sure you all can appreciate, uh, you know, loving so much, something so much that you want to take care of it. So this one is short, I promise. Why? Because I'm currently working on this. So um, just briefly, terns are small to medium-sized seabirds. Rosia terns, we talked about those briefly earlier. They nest on island beaches of sand, pebbles, or shells, and often near low vegetation and are almost exclusively found near or among common tern colonies. Um, Rosia terns are listed as endangered and there are there is approximately 85 percent of the breeding population concentrated in just three colonies um, in the northeast two of which are located in massachusetts on and they are on ram and on bird island so um i well during the b120 spill birds were hazed from uh, ram island and a shout out to drew major he wanted to to say that he appreciated all the volunteers and all the folks involved in that hazing because they literally did it 24 hours a day to haze the birds off the island, away from the oil, and to get them over to Penakees. Um, so because they were hazed off of their normal breeding grounds, um, their productivity for that year was greatly reduced. Um, in addition, nine roseate and 25 common terns were estimated to have been killed plus that additional generation that would have been produced. So as part of the, the negotiations, shore birds such as Dunlin, Greater Yellowlegs, and American Oyster Catcher were lumped into the turn injury assessment, and altogether $5 million were awarded to restore the loss for these birds. Regarding the restoration, I'm, well, that's like a big question mark. I'm, I'm excited to say that I am currently working on the next and final restoration project that is going to come out of the B120 oil spill project. And um, so stay tuned for that.
Thank you, Lakeith. Um, I don't own a boat, so I don't have a fun little story to say before this next uh, presentation, so I'm going to just turn it over to Michelle Craddock. She's the NRD coordinator from MassDEP, and she's going to be talking about lo lost coastal access, boating, and shellfish restoration. Michelle? Thank you. All right, so I offered to go last so I could make up any time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through these projects at you know pretty high level. Um, but I have some resources at the end of the slide if people want to do do a deep dive into you know lost coastal access or shell fishing. Um, so you know, as Jim mentioned, um, we receive settlement funds for a variety of different um, impacts to natural resources. I'm going to talk here about the projects that we implemented to address lost coastal access and use, lost recreational boating. Um, as well as uh, losses of recreational shellfishing and shellfish populations. Uh, we implemented about 10 projects throughout Buzzards Bay, although you can see there's a lot more dots on this map. And that's because some of these projects, primarily the shellfishing projects, happened you know, in multiple locations in multiple towns. Um, and to kind of reiterate what everyone else has been saying, like we couldn't have done any of these projects without our you know, tremendous partners that we've had, you know, BBC and all the other ones. And so I'll, I'll highlight them on each slide. But you know, truly, um, you know, none of these projects would be possible without our um, great partners. So in terms of lost coastal access in use, um, we really wanted to address you know, the fact that you know, people were not able to use beaches. They weren't able to access the shoreline due to the oiling for a, for a prolonged period. Um, so we funded a suite of projects to address that. Um, one included the, you know, the protection of about 450 acres of land in Fairhaven and Mattapoisa for public use. Brendan talked about that earlier, so um, I'm not going to discuss that in too much detail. Um, we also funded trail constructions at um, two, pr uh, two wildlife sanctuaries or state-owned lands um, at, by, owned by Mass Audubon and owned by Mass DCR. Um, the Mass Audubon project, which is highlighted in the picture on the bottom left, um, incorporated an all-persons trail there, um, which was really exciting. Um, so um, people with you know, disabilities, people that have um, difficulties seeing, can, can all, everyone can access this trail. So that, that was a really exciting partnership for us. Um, additionally, you can see in that middle photo there, um, we provided funding for universal handicap access at three different beach locations um, in Massachusetts, in Buzzards Bay. Uh, that included the purchase of Moby mats, um, shown in that picture, that allow wheelchairs um, or other people with mobility um, limitations to, to access um, the beach and the shoreline. It also included the purchase of um, wheelchairs that are um, waterproof and can be used on the beach um, to increase um, you know, public use of those areas. We provided funding um, to New Bedford Harbor um, for some upgrades at Palmer's Island, including improved um, trail access, picnic areas, things like that. And one of our most recent projects located in Rhode Island um, was the, um, the construction and reconstruction of the Black Point Loop Trail. Again, you can see the partners on the bottom of the slide, Buzzards Bay Coalition, variety of other state agencies, Mass Audubon, um, and City of New Bedford, Dartmouth, Fairhaven, Metapoisa, and Westport. In terms of lost recreational boating projects, um, we contributed funds towards the reconstruction of two boat ramps. Um, on the left, you can see the boat ramp in Onset Harbor in Wareham. On the right is the boat ramp in Dartmouth on Clark's Cove. Um, both of these boat ramps were you know, kind of in disrepair and the towns were looking for funds for those, so we were very happy to be able to contribute toward those. Uh, these boat ramps are used primarily you know, for people that want to access with canoes, kayaks, you know, smaller type boats for recreational opportunities and recreational shell fishing in the harbor. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, recreational shell fishing and shellfish restoration. Um, there was a, a tremendous amount of work um, and kind of planning and prioritization that went into these, the work that I'm going to describe on these next two slides. Um, so this is just a very high level overview. Um, but as many people have mentioned before, recreational shell fishing was severely impacted by the spill. And so we uh, funded uh, two main projects um, to um, compensate the public for those losses. Um, the first is a project um, that Mass Division of Marine Fisheries um, coordinated with a variety of municipalities throughout Buzzards Bay. 
Um, we have Tom Shields here from DMF who was very, very involved in that project. So feel free to find him afterwards for, for more details. Um, but you know, there was a lot of achievements that happened through this kind of five year long uh, project. Um, there were um, quahogs planted at 38 sites and oysters at 12 sites throughout the Bu Buzzards Bay area. Uh, DMF and partners oversaw the relay of nearly 5 million adult quahog to 35 restoration sites that are used for recreational only harvest in Buzzards Bay. Planted just under 500,000 upweller reared, reared juvenile quahogs in four restoration sites and planted about 1.75 million upweller nursery grown oysters at 10 sites. Um, so you can see there's a tremendous amount of effort that happened through this project all throughout the bay. Um, it was a great partnership between uh, Division of Marine Fisheries as well as all the municipalities. Um, there is uh, a lot of documentation and monitoring that went along with this project just to kind of understand how these methodologies worked, how successful they were. Um, and so DMF prepared a series of yearly monitoring reports as well as a final monitoring report. Um, and I'll post the link to those at the end of the presentation. In addition to that, um, the Nature Conservancy, DMF, and municipalities also implemented projects to increase uh, shellfish populations in the bay, you know, not strictly just for um, recreational shell fishing. And this really focused on bay scallop restoration and oyster restoration. In terms of bay scallop restoration, um, the methodologies here focused on uh, deploying adult bay scallops in spawner cages um, in Bourne, um, and that was you know, really to increase the likelihood of successful spawn, settlement, and result in increased populations. This led to a 277% increase in abundance of scallops in the, uh, in the area over the time period the project was implemented. Um, so we think that's you know, pretty successful results for that project. In terms of oyster restoration, it really focused on uh, deploying aged surf clam shells um, in a few different areas in the bay bottom, as well as planting of live oysters. Um, this project, um, you know, there was a lot of kind of, I think, lessons learned as it was implemented, um, but it did result in some good results in Bourne and Wareham um, that suggests um, that oyster growth um, and survivorship were increased at those sites due to the restoration actions. And again, that is very much scratching the surface on all the work that was done uh, using these settlement funds. Um, as I said, DMF has a lot of really in-depth progress reports um, on their shellfish work, um, and there's additional information available on kind of NOAA and MassDEP's oil spill sites as well. Um, so I'm gonna wrap it up with that and hand it back to Brett. Thank you, Michelle. Do we have any questions for the panel? Yeah, I mean, for the Buzzards Bay case, uh, the only one that I could think of was we tried to do some uh, primary restoration with planting, uh, salt marsh plug plantings out on Ram Island because as we've talked about, the uh, there was uh, trampling, foot trampling impacts, you know, of that marsh. You know, so with a combined issue of sea level rise, uh, coastal uh, or uh, uh, marsh front erosion, and then the trampling. We tried to do uh, some of those plantings. It, they, they never really worked that well, not in my opinion anyway. So that, that's the only real example we had for the case. Not that it can't be done in the future, uh, but it, you know, it's just, uh, I think we try to do the best we can. And 
and planning for things, but it's just, uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to try to answer that in advance, advance planning for the next, <laughs> the next disaster. Uh, I mean, we certainly have a lot of restoration projects in the queue, you know, whether or not you could implement it very quickly after a spill to try to expedite the recovery of a... Well, this is part of the spill, yeah. what I'm thinking about, too, is decision-making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Still, when you injure something, still run out. We haven't talked about that, Greg. Mm. But, um, uh, but working with the, the response side, the emergency response side, to help them change how they make decisions, what they prioritize, mm. how they spend, um, to optimize the evacuation efforts. And I, and I don't know if that was discussed with the John. I hope they are. I don't think they're going on to any extent, but it, it, it could be a good topic for another workshop. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, you're, you got a good point. I, I just don't think anybody's really, at least not from my knowledge anyways, where I work, um, you know, it's just not there. But it certainly is a valid point anyway. I don't know if anybody wants, you want to try to. J one comment would be with the legal protection of conservation land mm -hmm. making so w we're not only acquiring land we're placing conservation restrictions over the land we acquire or help others acquire or on private land so making sure that those conservation restrictions have the flexibility to enable ecological restoration sometimes in the past that's been overlooked and then it creates a, a legal issue um, just another thing that that uh, makes me, uh, another thought that comes to mind is interesting related to the spill when we're working with private waterfront landowners on private conservation. Since the spill, some folks has, have actually requested reserve rights for, to make it explicit that they can do protective measures in addition to um, restoration measures on their property in the event of a future spill. So I actually haven't responded to an actual spill yet, but I do, you know, the spill drills that I do go to, um, you know, NRD in that context, and, you know, the talk of restoration, you know, it's, we're not, w I don't think it's really been established within the framework where we fit quite yet, and that's, but it is an ongoing discussion of, of where, at least even where the, you know, how the assessment is gonna be addressed, al you know, alongside the response. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not sure how far those discussions have progressed in terms of looking at early restoration or emergency restoration, but as Jim said, I think, um, you know, it, we try to accomplish those things if, if we can, um, if we see a, an immediate need, but I, I think in terms of just preparing for it, at least in this, this bill drill situation, um, we're still trying to sort those things out. And part of the problem is But I, uh, the, one of the challenges we have, though, is uh, at least from the legal side, is is public engagement with those. And so, if you, the challenge you have is, you know, like, do we have something that gets implemented? I guess if it's, you know, uh, it's more on the RP side to say, look, we want to try to lessen our injury, and they take the lead on it, and you know, we say that maybe it's a feasible way to look at it. The the the, the contrary side that the legal folks usually have for us is. We've got to get the public engaged to comment on it. Do they accept that kind of project? So I, that's the challenge, I think. That would be my guess. I don't, we've had some less than, <laughs> we had some difficult challenges with some of that work, I think. But I mean, you know. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, then. I'd like to thank panel number three. Oh, okay. And, and reintroduce Kathy because she has one more thing. <laughs> I know Gerard's going to have some closing comments, but I did want to make one, uh, thank everybody for, for coming, and this has been a fantastic uh, symposium. But I think 
we have a big round of thanks to Julie because we would not be having this without her vision to hold it initially. So thank you, Julie. And just a, a final thought, I guess, is as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of panel three, I, at the time of the spill, I was the section chief for the site management section that oversaw long-term cleanup of sites. Um, and there are sites that were open before um, the spill that are, may still be open today going through the cleanup process. So it's incredibly impressive what uh, the Bouchard team did with the cleanup with dealing with a very complex site in just six years to get from the time of release to the time of final cleanup. That is an incredibly impressive thing and the legacy is ongoing with the NID project. So that's uh, pretty impressive. Thank you. Just a couple things to thank everybody that came from our partners here at Mass Maritime to the panelists, um, to everyone that took to bring this together, all the planning, my planning committee that helped, Kathy, Ed, Liz Fabian, Michelle. Um, it takes time, it takes a team to put something like this together, but it was very exciting to commemorate the 20th anniversary. A lot of us, it's kind of uh, mind boggling that it was 20 years ago and looking back at what that was like. Um, hopefully it's the only time we need to remember something like that, but I want to thank everybody for coming. It's been a good time planning it, and I think today was a real success, and I want to thank you all. <laughs>